Hi everyone, Morphe here. I'm very pleased today to be joined by ex-Christian Erin, who I think I first saw a, a few months back, and she was talking about all these journals and diaries that she had from, you know, Jesus Camp and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and I thought that would be right up Seth Andrews' sort of wheelhouse. So I did a tweet where I replied to Erin and put a that Seth Andrews TTA in it. And you ended up on Seth Andrews, didn't you, after after that? Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, th I think I had to prompt him a second time because there, there was a while went by when he said he was going to talk to you and then he didn't, and I prompted him well, a second time. We, we, we got talking on the DMs right away, but then um, I, I ended up moving to a different house, and so I had to kind of – I had to put a postponement on it, and then um, – we had both kind of, I just not talked about it a bit, but then your, yeah, your second prompting got us back on, okay, yeah, let's reschedule this. <laughs> yeah. But you did, you, you, or why I got on Seth Andrews show. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a really good episode. I, I mean, I'm a, I, I listened to Seth religiously, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I listened to that one, uh, one day, you know, uh, started it on the way to work and, and finished it on the way back. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a good talk. And you've been on with Neil, 604 mm -hmm. Atheist, uh, as well, and, and a few others. Is, is that right? Yeah, I've, I've, I think those were my two interviews so far. And then I was a part of um, the Friendly Neighborhood Atheist had a, had a round table discussion about death with dignity. Um, and so I took part of that as well. Yeah, he, he's great, isn't he? I, I really oh, like him. Right. Yeah, he's a great guy. I'll definitely yeah, he can... love to work with him again. <laughs> He, he came on um, here one day, and it was just uh, it was just a giggle fest. So right? <laughs> it was just like we both just set each other off, and uh, I think the actual video we put out was about an hour and twenty minutes or an hour and a half, and mm -hmm. and it was just a, a lot of giggling. But we we talked for about two and a half hours, and I cut <laughs> out an hour of giggling. <laughs> it was good. We got on really well. Um, yes. Yeah, so so moving to some various talk, talking points i've got here the first one i picked up was something uh you suggested about uh paul Gia being a, a big influence in your deconversion can you yeah. talk a little bit about that um so i i i had mentioned to you before this uh that i i didn't realize that i was a fundamentalist christian like growing up i i I was just a Christian. And so what, when it came to the point where I realized that like, no, I, we really did learn uh, young earth creationism. And I have excerpts from my journal that talk about the uh, evil nature of evolution, like the evil um, that being taught evolution is, is part of Satan's plan. And so, and I, even though I kind of somewhere else kind of I love science and I had read about those things, I, I sort of kept those things in, in um, separate compartments in my mind for a long time so somewhere along my my research journey i i got i found apologia's page and i binge watched i binge watched every episode that he had and so for me that that took me out of that fundamentalist kind of state of the young earth creationism and and then and then i went into his other videos too and he talks about the evidence for, you know the evidence for the resurrection and all his counter apologetics and I, I really do feel like he's probably one of the main uh sources that i had uh during my deconstruction so i always want to give him tons of credit because i think his work is so thorough and so clear um and just so useful <laughs> yeah yeah it's always very well researched i find yeah and he's a fellow canadian so a couple of the things he said just just exactly i was raised just the a province over from where he where he was raised so i i find his content just very relatable too yeah yeah um have you watched any vice rhino he's he's I have, he goes into yeah. evolution a lot yeah yeah i i've actually been spending more time on his channel lately i i hadn't watched a ton of his videos during my deconstruction but now i'm kind of going back and revisiting his videos because i had been told by a lot of people that i should check his videos out yeah uh apology and vice rhino go to the top of my watch list every time mm -hmm. they, they they release something so that um the other one that that did another canadian was godless cranium i had him on yeah. a few days ago yeah uh, but but he stopped producing for a while i got out of the habit so i'm gonna have to get back into the habit because yeah we spoke about that and i was saying about there was there's so many good canadian atheist channels out there you know including neil and yeah even though it's a, a small channel um lilith 
runs Veritas Voices, which I always listen to every week. Yeah, yeah, I've watched some of those as well. Yeah, um, and I and I just said, was it counterbalanced by the fact that uh, Jordan Peterson's Canadian? Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I uh, I talked to, I've talked on Twitter about how during, um, I didn't make a like a clean jump from you know, my Christian fundamentalism straight to like agnostic atheists. I, I took a couple detours along the way and I, I actually did spend some time in the Jordan Peterson camp. So now I, I find it all very, yeah, embarrassing and frustrating. And, and there's a lot of people in my own personal life right now who are big Jordan Peterson, Peterson fans and I'm find them the most hard to talk to. <laughs> uh, especially if they talk like he does in, uh, in total word salad. <laughs> Yeah, pin pin that jello to the wall is the kind of the expression. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there, was a, there was a great one in one of his discussions with Sam Harris where you know, Jordan Peterson started his usual sort of thing of, you know, instead of actually talking about the real world, he started talking yeah. about a play and he's saying, oh, metal, you know. Physical substrates and this and that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he was, he was saying it in the first scene of a play, if there's a rifle on the table, it better be used by the end of the first scene. And Sam Harris just said, I'm certainly waiting for the rifle in this answer. <laughs> I, I, a Sam Harris, and obviously I did spend some time on the, like Sam Harris and, Do and Richard Dawkins and like those four horsemen. And, and I still remember like the, the feeling of seeing people so like geniusly kind of make fun of some of the beliefs and, and make fun of that. Like that was a big part of my deconstruction was like being able to poke fun a little bit at, at those things and not taking it all so, so seriously. Um, I love Sam Harris. So like, I've, I've always enjoyed his, his, his take on things. Um, <laughs> and he's funny. Yeah, but, but for me, he doesn't do enough religion now. There's the, in yeah. fact, he, he was saying yeah, that. Of, I know a lot. He's yeah. a, a lot of people are kind of coming down on him now, but I, I guess I'm talking to his classic debates. Uh, those were those were important for during my deconstruction. Yeah, I I don't know. I think Sam sometimes does things because he thinks they're right rather than worrying about how people are going to react to them. <laughs> and yeah, I you know it's questionable whether it was a good idea, for example, to to have. Uh, what's that guy on on his podcast? The one who wrote the bell curve. Name escapes me at the moment. But uh, that yeah, it's a questionable decision. But and he got a lot of flack for it. But at the end of the day, I think he doesn't worry too much about. Well, mm -hmm. it's not that he doesn't worry about the flack. He just does things because he thinks they're right. But then he does whinge a bit when people actually you know tackle him about it. So it's good you picked Maggie up because Maggie was the next talking point because I saw your tweet about Maggie that you picked her up when your husband's grandma passed away. Yeah. And so Maggie's been with you for how long? Um, actually, just under a year. Uh, so we've known her for a few years, but we we inherited her. We got her um, last October, I think. So, uh, yeah, and she's just, she's just my little sidekick. She's a doll. She's the sweetest dog I've ever met. <laughs> And and she's she's always right next to me. Any any of the videos that I've done, and she's always sitting right. She's within a couple of feet of me always. I I joked uh, with Bela Bianca's always uh, tweeting out pictures of cute dogs, and I, I joked with her that because um, I'm a cat lover, that mm -hmm. I only really have cat people on, and I was making an exception in her case. But obviously, <laughs> I I love cats too. I really do. Um, yeah. She's 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 very barely a dog. Like <laughs> she doesn't yeah. chase she doesn't chase toys or like do that kind of thing. She'd like prefers to just sit on the bed and sleep and sun suntan. <laughs> I, I I I love dogs too. And uh, one of the things I was thinking of doing when I retire is actually training uh, guide dogs. Oh, that's cool. getting into yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah, Maggie's a very very cool looking dog, and you could just tell from sometimes from pictures that they're you know what their nature is like and i see you've, you've got her in your actual <laughs> uh photo your 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 uh oh, what do they call it your your profile, profile pic. yeah yeah 
Well, I try not to. Um, I try not to take any pictures. Like, put my kids online, so she's the next best thing. <laughs> she doesn't play fetch. No, nope. <laughs> she sleeps with her eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> but she she likes cuddles and belly tickles and all that sort of stuff. I've often said she's like my spirit animal. She just loves a, a comfortable, comfortable bed and fuzzy blankets and just like to be relaxed and quiet. She loves that. She's really funny like that. Yeah, it's it's always great. I I just yeah love animal companions. We've got we've got one cat who's a bit like a dog. You know, you come to his name, you shout out his name, and he'll mm-hmm. come running and sit on your lap and play. Uh, he actually gets hold of a ball and then he starts screaming because, and you know when he's screaming he wants somebody to go and play <laughs> it's funny um so the next thing i want to talk about when i first saw um you tweeting about all of these diaries and journals i i, I remember saying to you in a reply you know are you some sort of order some sort of what <laughs> order do you, do you do you, do you <laughs> ever throw anything memory. away <laughs> <clears throat> but you said it was actually your mum that kept that kept all these journals and um, things, and you... yeah, my mom. My mom's a bit of a hoarder. I I'm not a hoarder, but I definitely have always kept bo- like a box of sentimental things. So when I when I open the box, like there's I keep photos and I keep like concert tickets and like that, the things that are kind of important. Um, and so I'd kept all these journals. Um, I, I mean, they're they only I've got three of them. They span like. Um, probably about like two and a half years, but probably my two and a half most intense years in the faith, uh, including like a, a year long missions trip, missions project that I was on. So there's lots of, there's lots of things in here. One of them, was um, all the sermon notes I'd taken uh, at camp for an entire summer. And, and I spent like all summer at camp, I would, be a, I would be a counselor for many, many weeks in a row. And then I went to a different camp. I worked at two camps all, all summer and I took a lot of sermon notes. Um, and those are interesting. <laughs> and then the ones from when I was on my missions trip, it just shows for me, looking back now, they show so much of the cult type ma- <laughs> cult mentality. And, and that, that team in particular was really, um, kind of an awful experience so looking back through the notes on that i was i'm like i'm kind of surprised i spent another 10 or 12 years in the faith before i started to really question because that was that that should have knocked me out of it (laughs) so you said when we were messaging before this that you had a a few good excerpts from well i've been going through them trying to find some of the best ones um and like some of them are, are kind of um, like almost painful to read because there was obviously I was, I was struggling a lot through some of these, but some of them are just hilarious to me. So like the, the one, one that I find that probably the, the funniest was this, um, the sermon notes from one of the camps I was at. And it talks about how evolution is evil, that it's just evil. Um, let me see if I can find a good one. So with it, with the evolution is evil thing, because yeah. I, I, I often see them tweeting go. things about, you know, if evolution is true, why should we care about anything and blah, 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 yeah. you know, all, sort, all sorts of stuff. But none of that invalidates it. No. If, 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 if belief in evolution, and it were belief in evolution, accepting evolution, because it's a well-established scientific theory, Mm-hmm. actually means that you become, I don't know, a nihilist or a monster or genocidal maniac or something like that, then I'm sorry that it's just an argument from consequences to say that makes evolution mm-hmm. untrue. It's still true. Mm-hmm. Uh, props not in the Jordan Peterson sense of true, but yeah, <laughs> it's still true as in concordant with that. <laughs> so to me, it's it's just not an argument at all. Yeah. Sorry, you, you said you found something. I found the one page about the about the evolution uh, sermon that we had. So it, it, they talk about obviously man was created in the image of God. Uh, we we look like God. I had written in my journal. <laughs> we are the result <laughs> of a precious thought of God. People are God's finest creations. And then I have big 
underlined here is we are not coincidences or accidents. We are his beloved creation. So again, what, like what you were just saying that like if evolution is true, then uh, our value goes down. Like we have no value. We have no um, worth in that way. Um, and tons of claims here too. Just like only God can make something alive. <laughs> you are God's highest creation. That's something to be proud of. And then another, on the next page, it says the effects of believing in evolution, um, that man does not see God as a perfect creator and that man does not see himself as the perfect image of God. And then there's a whole page here about how believing in evolution makes us insecure, insecure. And they were, I think this was, um, they were really targeting the girls at the youth group during this one, because it, it was talking about how uh, belief in evolution basically we're, it means that we're not beautiful <laughs> and we're not beautiful. We're not, we're not special. There's nothing, there's nothing about us that makes us special or loved. And I, I, I don't, I don't even remember this sermon, honestly, cause I, I feel like, um, it was so, it was, it wasn't new to me. This information wasn't anything that I was learning that day. I was just taking the notes down. And I, I sort of feel like when I was writing these things down, it was like, well, yeah, obviously, obviously evolution can't be true because that would make us all, you know, just a coincidence. <laughs> and, uh, and that can't be true. <laughs> and so it's, so like, it's, it's trying to give you a false dichotomy amongst mm -hmm. other things. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how you view it now, but, but I always viewed it as the fact that, that we're made of stardust. I actually it, find evolution to be more inspiring to me yeah, now. It, it connects us to all other life, and we're connected to the universe by the fact that the very, the head, certainly the heavier elements in our makeup mm -hmm. didn't exist at the start of the universe or, or in only very small amounts. And so it was, you know, supernova explosions that produced these heavier elements that we're, that we're made of. And so we're part of the universe and we're connected to all other life. And it, to me, that's more inspiring. It is. And I, and I, I feel that too. I've had like this, this idea that you can't have um, like deep, deep meaning and deep inspiration on atheism. Uh, I find the exact opposite. I've ever, since I've kind of, come out of it I, I look around constantly amazed I'm constantly amazed by things like I can't believe I can believe I find it so interesting that we've made it this far that humans are here that we've uh, overcome all these obstacles like I have so much more respect for the life on earth as it is now knowing even just being able to look at hit the time and history in like the deep time sense like that that was an actual like perspective that I was unable to do as a Christian I, could, I couldn't appreciate how how long it's been, <laughs> you know, that well, time scale. Were you brought up in a sort of young earth scenario? Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can't even imagine deep time, can we? I mean, we're not, we've not evolved to uh, cope with those sort of numbers and mm -hmm. that sort of time scale. When we live, you know, what do we live, maybe 70 to 100 years mm -hmm. You know, it's and, and and of course historically it was far far less than that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you don't go, have to go back very far, a hundred, hundred and fifty years, and li even, life, lifetimes were were halved. Even just having the freedom to contemplate it a little bit, you know, like to think about it, um, that's like a that's a new thing for me this last year. Being able to really, I know we can't really understand it, but just to try to think about it. Um, that's a great exercise. <laughs> That's an awe-inspiring exercise to do, uh, and and something that I I never I, I was never had the freedom. I I couldn't do it when I was uh, a young Earth creationist and a fundamentalist. I the the history was just short. It was we've been been here for like six thousand years, and you know it's just been a steady downhill <laughs> ever since. <laughs> and so it was a really it's really big shift in the way I actually see the world and that's and that's it's great I enjoy it I love thinking about um the whole process I think it's fascinating I, I don't know how they managed to square the whole fallen world things and things are getting worse 
yeah. with looking at how people live now, certainly in Western democracies, compared to how people lived in the Middle Ages? Again, I feel like this, this, the way that they see things, they can only, they only see it as their lifetime. So because things are changing, uh, for like, so my parents, like things have changed since the, you know, uh, 60s, 70s, um, and and whatever they they kind of look at as new and changing to them, it, they kind of interpret it as a decline because that's how the world works. Everything's in a steady decline. So all ch all change is probably bad. All new things are probably bad. And yeah, we have all this you know technology and stuff, but but there's way more harm than good. So it's always very negative. It's always and and they they really are drawing on that idea that like the fallen world. So ever since you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, it's been a steady decline of death and misery and, and everything since then. And that's a, that's a big one to try to even get them to consider that maybe the world's not that bad. So they wouldn't, for example, think it's a good thing that there's been an improvement in women's rights an improvement in LGBTQI rights yeah. and so on. I, I don't think that they would, I, I I know that they're they don't recognize the LGBTQ plus community. They they believe that that is part of the corruption of man, and that's been a tricky one. Because even as a Christian, I was LGBTQ affirming, um, and I don't know how I squared that away, but I did. I I didn't. I think I kind of just kept it at like that's not my place, and I think that I could see that by putting my you know, my foot down on anything that that was me not being loving to other people. So I squared it away somehow. But um, I don't know, I think the I think there's a, a gratitude, obviously, for like women's equality, but then there's a small part that comes into an, almost every conversation about how, um, you know, that's not what women were meant to do. The women weren't meant to do it all uh, work and have kids and all. And I know my mom talks about that a lot because she was a young mom during the eighties and she, she sees it as that there was so much pressure put on her to do it all. And, and so I tried to tell her that the equality, the movement isn't, isn't so you have to do it all. So you have the choice, you have the choice to do it. And so it's kind of nuanced. We kind of have like, sometimes I feel like they are a little bit more progressive, but then other times I'm like, Nope, there comes, the, those traditional fundamentalist views, they, they kind of creep into every conversation. Yeah, I, I mean, I often say to people who, for example, are against marriage equality, well, if you don't want to marry somebody of the same sex, you don't have to. Just uh, don't people, do it. <laughs> yeah. but people who are against abortion, well, you don't have to have one. Nobody's forcing mm -hmm. you. So, um, yeah. Yep. Um, my mom has fought adamantly for pro-life things <laughs> she's been on the front lines in some of those protesty like, like those movements and she's been a an advocate for pro-life and she's spoken at pro-life events and and it's it is really it's really interesting to see that and to feel differently from her but i remember watching a video some time ago i think it was by holy kool-aid and he was talking about the views the pro-life views and how they're really pro-birth because if you actually ask yeah. them who's willing to adopt oh, all the hands go down and who's willing to actually pay into the health care and education of of all these children that you're forcing women to have yeah yeah they don't they don't want to do that either i mean we all know that the same people who are i i, I don't want to generalize too much all generalizations are dangerous as they say even this one but many of the people who are fighting on the pro-life bill are also the ones that don't want to pay any taxes it is it is interesting to see that yeah they i i totally agree i i i love the term just the forced birthers because that's all i that's all it is <laughs> force birthers and and they don't want to have anything to do with it afterwards and they're the same people that seem to be not wearing masks so i don't know how pro-life they are <laughs> yeah absolutely and it's that's the same thing isn't it 
Mm-hmm. I think I was talking with GC about that. I've had so many conversations this week because I've actually been off for the <laughs> I've week. Seen that. You have had a lot this week. <laughs> and, and yeah, it will go back. It will go back to normal. Maybe one a week or one every two weeks uh, from tomorrow because I'm I'm back to work uh, tomorrow and I'm not off for a while. Oh, is that why? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I've, I've been off this week and I, I've fed in a lot of a lot of people this week, and so I can't remember exactly which conversation <laughs> this was in. But we're talking about people who were carrying out active shooter drills in school yeah. to try and help children survive in case of a maniac getting onto campus with an assault rifle, mm-hmm. but they won't wear a mask. To me, that's completely inconsistent. Oh, it totally, totally is. I I don't know how to talk to that particular mindset. I, I there's so many inconsistencies. There's so many contradictions in the way that they're thinking. But there's there's very little you can say um, because they've also been they buy fully into these ideas that like if that you can't trust the media and that you can't trust these people. So they'll call they'll turn around and call you brainwashed or call you um a sheep or whatever term they want like it's but to try to get them to look in the mirror at the situation like it's just it's it's almost impossible i don't know i don't know how other people's conversations are going mine's mine aren't going well (laughs) all i can do is all i can do at this point is just do a a plea for an emotional bargain you know because I, i i have an autoimmune disease and so i'm like if you are concerned about me and my health will you please wear a mask for me like, and that's about as far as I can get with those conversations. Yes. Oh. Of course, of course, you did mention before we started recording that you're uh, at risk. Yeah. I, I also consider myself to be reasonably at risk because, you know, I'm old. I had an operation recently and so on. And I do have one or two, two little health issues. Uh, I'm probably, you know, I'm not in the sort of autoimmune camp, but yeah, this, it's it's a concern and I don't really want to get this disease. Um, we, <laughs> I've heard I've heard arguments from people that are like, well, if people are at risk, they should just stay home. Well, like I am staying home, but I I do also need to leave my house sometimes. And it'd be nice to know that I can trust my community to try to protect me when I do when and if I have had to go out. So (laughs) there's the arguments are bad. Their arguments are bad. That's all. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Uh, We've been uh, and I've said this on, uh, I think, every single conversation I've had this Mm -hmm. weekend for a while. Uh, here in Western Australia, we've had zero community spread. Mm-hmm. All the cases we, we have that you'll see reported, and there aren't many of them, are people who have returned from overseas. Mm-hmm. And the second that they return from overseas, we sequestered them in a hotel for two weeks, security mm-hmm. guarded. And, you know, that basically they don't get out until they've tested negative after two weeks. Yeah, uh, and that has, has completely stopped community spread. And we're very fortunate that we had an election just last year, and we got mm-hmm. rid of how our sort of right wing liberal government. They're, they're called liberals, but they're the, they're big. The That's the same here. Your sort of right wing party. Yeah, we don't. Uh, we have liberal and conservative here. And yeah. The other, uh, the other parties. And we, we got ourselves a Labour government here in WA, although the federal government uh, overall is is uh, liberal, so they're, they're conservative. And our, our prime minister is actually a, an evangelical nut job. Oh. But, but, but this is Australia. We get rid of prime ministers regularly. I've been here nine yeah. years, and I think we, I've lost count of how many different prime ministers oh, we've really? had. Because if, 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 they, if they fuck up, they're out, they're out, they're out. basically. They're out. Yeah. That's interesting. So it must be really, really hard to see what's going on in the US right now for you. Too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, no I'm, doubt I'm, left. Sorry, I'm I'm glued to it as well. Like I, I we're doing. I would say we're doing pretty well here in Canada. Oh, you know, eighty percent of the people are wearing masks, and and everybody is for the most part of social distancing. There's not these big breakouts that's go, that are happening. Not in my area anyway. So we're doing okay. We're doing much better than. And I'm only like fifteen minutes from the border, <laughs> so it's so it's, it's interesting. But we're doing pretty well. And and they're really pushing it, pushing the masks and social distancing um, with the government. They're they're definitely fighting for people to do that, and then we've been compliant for the most part. And there's not a whole lot of people complaining about their personal freedoms and their rights or anything. It's a little different here. 
Yeah, uh, it's interesting you mentioned the 80% figure there because when I did some research the other day for my wear, ma- wear a mask rant, mm-hmm. 80% was considered to be a figure that would be at least as good, if not better, than the lockdown and social distancing. Hmm. And I think it operates on the same basis that if 80 people, 80% of people are, are wearing it and not mm-hmm. spreading, it's like having 80% of people vaccinated against a disease or something like that. Yeah. That, I just pulled that number out of my out of my head because I was just kind of noticing how many people. Because uh, I I've been out I've been out a few times now. I was I stayed home for a long time, but I I have been out now and I wear a mask. My kids wear masks, um, and we have we have been out a few places now. And it seems like it seems like <laughs> without measuring or counting, about eighty percent of the people were being compliant. So maybe that's why we're doing so well. Yeah, uh, it should have a big effect there. But mm-hmm. I realise that we've just, for the last sort of 12 minutes or so, <laughs> wandered completely away from the talking point. Have you found anything else oh, sorry, from, I'm, your, I'm from your journals? Oh, my journals. Um, I, I have a lot. Well, one thing that was really interesting for me when I was looking through my journals is how utterly consumed I was um, with sexual purity and myself and everyone else who was on in my life and especially when I was on that that uh, missions team we had strict rules no dating and I would say about a third of my journal or more is me um, just completely like disheveled and and upset because so and so somebody from my team was I thought maybe having a relationship or a secret relationship (laughs) and so uh, one of the things that was the most like evident was that my whole teen and a young adult life was consumed with this purity culture. Um, purity culture, if you're aware, you know, the abstinence only and like, don't date unless you're planning on kind of looking for a spouse and that sort of thing. And there was a, a lot of times that I uh, was, I have, I used to write down my prayers a lot too. And there was a lot of prayers for intervention for, you know, the, for God to take hold of the minds of everybody because they were all being deceived. Um, another thread that kind of runs along in a lot of the pages, this idea that there was spiritual warfare happening around all the time. So I grew up in a fairly charismatic type denomination. So heavy emphasis on um, d- demons and spiritual warfare and, and declaring, declaring this and declaring that and ha- taking hold taking captive your thoughts and a lot of that so there's a lot of prayers that i had written down that were just um just very very intense (laughs) there i was i was weeping over the uh impurities in my group (laughs) so i i don't know if you want to hear like an excerpt but i'll i'll try to find one A lot of a lot of them were just concerns that, um, especially my my female friends, were gonna do something that they were gonna regret for the rest of their lives, and that was definitely like a, a that extreme viewpoint thing that was evident throughout all. It, there was only ever two options: you're either gonna be 100% pure, or you're probably gonna be have a regret that you're gonna live with for every day of the rest of your life. Everything was always very extreme. So I can see that in all of my journal entries that um, I'm either pray I'm either praising and like completely over the top in love with Jesus and and thrilled about everything, or I'm in absolute misery. Like there was there was just very little balance. I don't know if I can actually find anything worth reading. <laughs> um, uh, it's actually one of your tweets that goes uh, uh, along this line. Yeah, And it says, the very idea that a person needs a relationship with Jesus, which you've got in quote marks, in order to, <laughs> in order to, be, in order to be whole, has mm-hmm. the potential to set up unrealistic expectations in real life relationships. Mm-hmm. And then you said underneath, you complete you. Mm-hmm. And, I, and that's going along that line, the whole idea of a relationship with Jesus. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about that just now. Yeah. So how did they... How did they spin this relationship with Jesus thing to you? Um, there was this automatic assumption that we all we all were so horribly broken that humanity, the fallen world, everybody, that we are naturally inclined to do things that are hurtful, like that are harmful to ourselves, and that's because we have this huge 
void in us that um, it's it's needs to be filled with something. That's a, this is kind of how it was. There's there's a huge void in your heart in your heart that needed to be filled. And if you don't fill it with Jesus, it will be filled with something else. And that was usually something to do with demons. And so the only way that you could be whole, as in not having this huge void in yourself, was to be completely, completely in love with Jesus. Um, so the relationship thing, they really, really impressed this idea that you needed to have this very personal relationship with Jesus, which was lots and lots of prayer, lots of meditation. Um, there was constantly a, uh, uh, a conversation, like a running conversation. Well, what's Jesus saying to you? And what is Jesus doing in your life? And like, and I look back now and it's like, uh, you know, basically it's like, well, anything that good that happened in your life or anything that was going well, if, if every good mood that you had, you obviously you, you would have to attribute it to Jesus. That's how he got all this, you know. Um, I struggled with this idea that I needed to have this personal relationship with Jesus um, because I maybe I was always just a little more skeptical than everybody, but I struggled to have my encounters. Uh, I they sometimes they would happen. It would almost always happen at an event where the music was loud, everybody was really like ecstatic, um, and you know I would I would have those moments of you know, just, uh, what's the word, like a transcendent kind of experience. Um, and looking back now, I'd say there's, there's nothing about those experiences, even the ones that I wrote about so passionately about my deep, deep affection for Jesus. Um, there's nothing about those experiences that are any, any different than, um, a concert that I went to last year. And I, I, I was, um, singing along and I was crying because <laughs> I loved the music so much. And, um, and so I think it was really just this, this chasing after this, those, uh, those moments of like the, a dopamine rush and those, those sort of a thing, but they really, they really did push it that if you're not having those experiences often, if not daily, then, um, you, you don't have that personal relationship and now, and then you're, you're basically, you're broken. Like you're not, so it it was it, it was really interesting to to kind of come out of that and realize that like I'm I'm fine I'm fine without having to chase after these kind of uh, ambiguous kind of weird moments that I I was supposed to attribute to Jesus later on I I'm I'm not broken and I don't need to have those experiences uh, to be myself and to be a good person to be a, a person who could have a good relationships with people. Sorry, I'm talking a lot, but, um, and then I think I I've seen a lot with my own life and with other people that when you have that idea from the beginning that you aren't a whole person, um, and then couple that with the idea of like biblical marriage and that, you know, two become one and, and like you guys are, you know, this, like the epitome of God's creation is when there's like a, you know, a man and a woman specifically only a man and a woman get together and experience that unity. And it was honestly preached as like the, the, the union between a husband and a wife was that experience of unity was likened to like the experience of the Trinity or like heaven, a heavenly experience. So there was a lot of chasing after this marriage type relationship. And I think um, I've seen a lot of people and including myself struggle at times because the reality is when you're in a relationship with another human being, like things are not always perfect. Like you, <laughs> you can grate on each other and you can, irritate each other and you can let each other down and you can make mistakes. You can. Um, so I think there was this, uh, this kind of learned neediness that is taught at the church that you need that partner to be some, to be okay. And it's, it's maps on completely to codependency, which is an interesting, I've seen a lot of things that map onto other things that we know now aren't healthy. Yeah, <laughs> you've thrown up a few things there. I know, actually. I can talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fine. It, it's much easier than me. I haven't I've come up with the, the actual talking points. I'd much rather I just stay quiet and my guests too are much more interesting than I am than most of the talking. And so uh, one thing that, that came up there was the, the one man and one woman thing. Mm -hmm. And have you, have you ever seen that 
uh, sort of meme about all the different types of marriage in the Bible. Yes, yeah, which, totally. Yeah, one, one man and 300 concubines and, you know, all this <laughs> yeah, sort of 700, stuff. whatever it is, 700 concubines, 300 wives. Yeah, and those things are just like, literally, we, we learned, we read them in church, but I don't remember anybody ever, like, saying, like, this is not biblical. Like, this is biblical marriage. This isn't what we're teaching is biblical marriage. And and I would say that the the running apologetic for that was just oh it was a different time it was a different <laughs> time and that i've even heard it being like uh you know well all the men this is kind of i've heard from mormon mormonism as well it's like all, all a lot of the men died because of war so there was a lot of you know they needed <laughs> anyway uh the, 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 so, the answers just aren't good <laughs> that yeah that throw, that itself throws up mm -hmm. lots of things the whole apologetic if it's a different time mm -hmm. so so why did god write his scripture for one tiny little part of the middle east mm -hmm. at a particular moment in the history and why is so much of that now really not relevant to today shouldn't it be a message for all time for all people yeah that was a big question that came up for me during my deconstruction i was like i just why why doesn't god have some sort of you know renewal system that he does every time a culture moves to a different continent or has a different language like why is it in why did he choose to uh speak to this t small small community on a tiny little strip of land in a language that he knew would be a dead language <laughs> or you know <laughs> or languages that die and then that that just leads to other questions too and like why if his word was more important, then why are there translation errors? Why does it... <laughs> and yeah, it just the questions just continue to roll. <laughs> yeah, because I've seen the different times thing used for things like slavery as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sorry if you know. So there was a time in the past when slavery was okay, yeah. and then there's things like uh, you know Adam and Eve. They had three sons. So how did they propagate the species? <laughs> so so incest was okay back then yeah D different times it seems that different times is a, a hand wave to get rid of you know to get away from all sorts of things you know the 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 things in the old testament uh, or the hebrew bible as i try to call now because i realize how horribly disrespectful christians can be by calling it the old testament um that was a big kind of starting point in my in my deconstruction was kind of trying to because I, I think I a lot of people I, I have met now that have this experience that like I sort of first started to try to make sense of my particular denomination that I had grown up and that was the Pentecostal and so I I was trying to get well what was like the first Christianity and then I kind of went well to understand the early Christians I should really have a better idea of the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible and and when I read was reading through the Old Testament again when I and I read it before um some of the things that happened in there are they actually like made me cry like I like if this was true this was just so horrible <laughs> um like the Jep Jephthah's daughter or like the Lot and his daughters and there's a few things there that I'm just like why i never we never talked about that in church growing up like we didn't talk about that that was a oversight like let's talk about the let's talk about how great david was or how you know joseph and the and the colorful coat and stuff like that was what we we learned about nobody i can't imagine teaching the actual stories to kids but. Uh, Seth Andrews did a whole episode where he did uh, biblical stories, you know, sort of Christian yeah. uh, reading for kids. And he yeah, told all the stories about the, <laughs> was it 200 foreskins as a dowry and all yeah. that sort of stuff. <laughs> yes. Um, coming back again, something else you reminded me about with the relationship thing. I mean, you and I don't, we don't really know each other, but I would say that we have more of a relationship than it's possible to have with Jesus in the <laughs> fact that, that we sometimes reply to and comment <laughs> on each and like like each other's tweets. We yeah. DM occasionally. Uh, we're having this conversation. And, and 
Yeah, so <laughs> we, we have more of a relationship than it's possible to have with Jesus. He doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, speak back. He doesn't DM you or, or like any of your tweets or anything like that. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I'm interested, this is going to come out of left field because it wasn't a talking point, but you mentioned that okay. you went on a mission. Mm -hmm. And did you say it was for, for a year? Um, yeah, I did a one-year discipleship program. It okay. was mission. And yeah, you went out, you know, proselytizing to people and that sort of stuff during that time? Yeah, so it was the first year, my first year out of high school, and I there's a there's a program that runs worldwide called YWAM so youth oh shoot I can't remember what it stands for <laughs> um so this was a kind of a version of that but it was put on by the Pentecostal Church of Canada uh, and so yeah I joined this I joined this team and so th basically what we did was we spent a ton of time doing like our bible studies um and then we spent a, a good amount of time doing community service locally and and then across Canada. So we started off in our home city and did outreach stuff. So this was like, I was knocking on doors, I was standing in malls, and it was one of the most embarrassing um, things to date <laughs> I've ever done. Um, but we were we were training ourselves too to, to go overseas. And we'd gone to Mexico, we'd worked at an orphanage for a few weeks, um, just being helpful. And so we had been practicing to go to Haiti. Um, so this whole team, it was like eight months of preparation to go to Haiti. And this was back in 2004. And something happened where we couldn't end up going to Haiti. Something happened with the government. So we ended up going to Scotland and England. And we just continued to do what we were doing in Canada. So we did street ministry. Um, and we tried to... And we also put on youth youth events too. So I we had ba a band. I played bass guitar in the band. We did music. Um, we did speaking. So we all had to do like preaching, and and all of us had to take kind of take turns doing preaching. So um, it was a it was a very intense year. It was really hard. Um, it was fun at some time, at some points. I loved being on the band. That part was fun, um, and it was really eye-opening for me to um especially just going to a cu another culture like scotland and england it's not that different from us but i think they are uh, more secular um so doing a lot of street ministry and running into people who just they just didn't care <laughs> i remember feeling like because we we had this push that everything had to be intense all the time intense you have to be on fire you have to to do this and we would go share our testimonies and do our speaking and people would be like well that's cool <laughs> and we were like you, you don't understand like if you don't if you don't change your whole life and make it focused on jesus all the time you're gonna go to hell like it was it was and i i yeah yeah that was a that was a i didn't i couldn't i didn't quite like process that one until fairly recently where i was like why didn't people care about our message because my my instincts because of how I was raised was that well because they're being they're currently being deceived by the devil <laughs> so and then it didn't ever occur to me until recently that they literally just might not have cared because it's irrelevant yeah did you convert anyone during this period I did not <laughs> <laughs> I tried very very hard I one of the only people that I have a clear memory of converting was um uh somebody at my home she'd already been kind of coming to church and she was questioning whether she be, should become a christian and this was such an interesting experience to look back on because she was asking me questions and i remember her asking i can't remember what the question was but i remember her asking a question and i said i actually don't know and she was so refreshed by my answer that i didn't know that she became a christian because she because she up to that point she'd been thinking about becoming a christian but she was kind of getting a little bit put off by how everybody kind of seemed to know all the answers and so she met a christian who admittedly said I, i'm not really sure and and then she became a christian and she still is to this day so um yeah it's a little, it's, a little hard it kind, of, it kind of sparked my follow-up question which was gonna be <laughs> you know do you feel guilty about that now <laughs> um i don't I, if I had had more people that I had directly influenced, um, I would, might feel guilty about it. But um, 
no i think she i think she i still know her and i think she's like a her values are are she's such like a humanist already at heart that i don't i don't see her going out and doing anything that i would you know feel bad about I, th I think she's just a happy person and she goes to church now and so it doesn't really bother me that much but yeah that's an interesting point that you bring up there actually it just struck me just then why is it that religion so often seems to be at odds with humanism because i don't see them as being exclusive um i think there's definitely branches of christianity that you know, like you know these progress more progressive and liberal christians they are definitely i would identify them as like human humanistic um i i i personally think it comes down to the doctrine itself the doctrine teaches you know the bible itself teaches so many things about mistrust and the you know um mistrusting other people and not giving people the benefit of the doubt and not letting people just uh, go on there there's such a there's such a push that to judge other people, even though I know they says not to judge, but there's so much judgment, especially like in the New Testament. And there's so much criticism. If you read Paul's letter, like he, he comes down hard on everybody. And so um, I think it's just kind of sinister kind of written into the words. If you see it, you can see it, but it's relabeled as love. I would say it's kind of like, so it, as a, Christian, they think that the most loving thing you can do is to warn your fellow that your fellow neighbor that they're going to go to hell. And like, that to me is not at all what love is. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why they can kind of separate those two things because they do love their family members and they do love people. But when it comes to like what, what godly love is, it's not the same thing. Okay. <laughs> So another one of your tweets, and I really do like your tweets. I didn't have to look very far down your tweets to actually find lots and lots of really good ones. Whereas if you looked at mine, lots of them would be junk and there'd be an occasional good one in there. And what you say here is the gospel is only good news, good news again in quotes, if you have already been convinced that you are wretched, unworthy and broken. I am going to do the best to raise my kids with the belief that they are fundamentally good, worthy, and whole. And and at the time of me snipping that, that had 889 likes, which is really good. In fact, you've got some with more likes than that, but that's a really good tweet, if you ask me. Uh, do you want to speak to that a little? I feel like <laughs> most of my thought is right in there in the tweet, and that if by the time you're by the time the gospel appears like good news some some circumstance in your life or somebody who has talked to you somebody has already influenced you to the point where you believe that you are broken that you need saving and so and that can speak to almost any situation when you hear people's testimony for some reason or another they have become convinced that they are broken um and i I think that for me, like the antidote to, for my own, like for my raising my kids, I, I, I speak to kind of like, how do you, how do you protect your kids against these like harmful ideologies? And I think that the best way to do it is to make them less susceptible to the message in the first place. So when somebody comes up to them and tries to tell them that they're broken, they're, I hope that they someday laugh at it. They're like, what do you mean? How, what do you mean I'm broken? I'm just, I'm a human. Like, um, so I think that um, it just it comes down to that idea that who who else has influenced you in your life and and why did you before you believed the gospel why did you believe that you were broken and I think that's probably the deeper question um, to be asking before you start asking whether the gospel is true <laughs> like whether you know you need saving in the first place. I think this branches out from here as well that. I hear so many apologetics like the Cologne Cosmological and, you know, Teleological and all these sort of things. And to me, they're only convincing if you already believe in the God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, fi I find them wholly unconvincing. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. It's like the, 
like going into it if you if you didn't already go into it thinking that um we're special like or that you know like that there's some spark in humans like if, if you if i I mean, I'm trying to do my best raising my kids, but like I, I, I my kids, I, I try to teach them like animals, even like even Maggie, <laughs> like Maggie is like a, a, a being and she has emotions and she thinks about things like, you know, she obviously has something going on in there because she's very deeply attached to us and she doesn't like th- certain things. And like, um, so right from the beginning, just think those presuppositions that we have going into it i think make you susceptible to ideas that like we are so special and and yet also broken um i feel like that's probably the best way to counter counter religious ideologies is to work on the people who are becoming convinced of these things i think that they're they they themselves need some um some boosting in their own self-esteem and their own kind of the way that they're seeing themselves, the way that they see the world, the way that they're looking at it. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. Every time you speak to, to a tweet that I'm reading out, you seem to be leading on to the next tweet <laughs> that I've got on the list, yeah, which I'm, is really good. It, it's like we've rehearsed. I'm very consistent with my thoughts, I guess. <laughs> Because the next one is, you can become a Christian on a knee-jerk reaction and everybody celebrates, or everyone celebrates. You need no good reason to convert. But when you leave, the same people will now expect you to have expertise in philosophy, history, biology, psychology, archaeology, anthropology, etc. <laughs> that's got 1.3k likes. It's a, that's an excellent tweet. And, yeah, it's interesting because how often do you see theists of all stripes who have virtually nothing in common other than the fact they think there's a god all backing each other up on twitter and facebook and things like that oh yeah yeah definitely often um yeah i i feel like that that tweet really does sum up twitter (laughs) (laughs) the the theist uh and non-theist or atheist agnostic conversation it's like uh, I just, I, I don't know, I don't know how many hundreds of testimonies I heard and, and there was, it, it could be anything, like it doesn't matter. You could become a Christian because you uh, found a, a coin that, I don't know, <laughs> on the ground, like it literally doesn't even matter. It does not matter the testimony, why they become a Christian and everybody congratulates the person and welcome them into the fold. And, but when you leave, um, then you get the, all the apologetics and all the, you know these wild like you need to prove this you need to prove that you need to and i'm like how there's how how is anyone to just leave like you have to actually almost prepare for the onslaught um when you publicly come out as a non-believer especially if you were a believer beforehand like there is a high high expectation for you to be um very well well informed on all of these things even though i feel like it's a total double standard because they either didn't know anything about it when they became a Christian or they only learned about it through apologetics. And even there, they're not getting good information in my opinion. (laughs) No, that's absolutely true. I'm always appalled by how little many, let's just stick with Christians actually know about their own religion and how it was put together. And this is even, you know, priests, you know, Vicars, school chaplains of people that I've come across a lot, and they seem to have no idea at all about mm-hmm. all the scribal errors, the Council of Nicaea, yeah. any of this stuff. They have no idea. And even going back further, how it actually evolved from Judaism, which itself evolved from Zoroastrianism and everybody else that conquered the Middle East. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not even it's not even on their radar to consider these things. Like it's 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 absolutely not um the only his, like kind of historical thing that was ever put forth in my in my upbringing was like we need to be like the first church <laughs> and they're basing that on just the new testament scriptures it's like um it was never discussed like oh are we sure that these scriptures actually go back to the first church <laughs> um so they they had this idea that the first church would look like this um 
And so imagine my surprise when I started going into the like New Testament studies and the history of it and like what early Christianity looked like. Just the fact that they didn't have an agreement from the very beginning blew my mind in the very <laughs> in the beginning of my deconstruction. They have and I, I can't imagine going to like my pastor um, of my church now, like my former pastor and, and asking him, like, what did he think about the, you know, the variations between the, the different early Christian sects between the uh, docetists and this and that, you know, like it, <laughs> he had no idea, <laughs> but I do now because I needed to, to leave. It's a double, yes. a double standard. <laughs> but that leads me on to something else. Another <laughs> one of your tweets. <laughs> It says, when I left Christianity, I didn't make a clean break from magical thinking. At some point, I also believed in law of attraction, astrology, astral projection, chakras and vibrational healing, homeopathy, ancient aliens. <laughs> Atheism does not equal skepticism. Yep. <laughs> have, have you recovered from those things now? Pardon me? Have you recovered from those things now? Um, I think so. Yeah, I uh, I have a Scorpio tattoo on my finger. <laughs> oh, no. I um, I at one point was convinced that I was an alien <laughs> because I and I realized what the thought process was there that was not not working for me was that I I you know you told so often that. Um, especially as a Christian, I can mostly only speak to be Christianity because that's what I was. They're told like, we have the truth. And so when I started to realize that there were things wrong with Christianity, I still kind of had this assumption that, well, then there's got to be something else that is true. And so I spent a ton of time going down these different, uh, different ideas that maybe they could explain. And like Christianity also like apologetics is what best explains this, whatever. So when I realized pretty pretty clearly that like Christian, the Christian, their explanations really don't explain it the best. <laughs> so what else explains it the best? And I, I did, I kind of went down these different things, um, trying to, I think also kind of keep my, myself tied to some sort of, um, superstitious kind of belief because at that part, it was hard to let go of that. Like I, I, having the idea that I had some sort of control over something bigger um so a lot of attraction was really attractive <laughs> to me <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and then i realized later on that a lot of tra attraction is quite literally the same ideology as the word of faith people who are speaking their you know faith healing and so that was you know it came out of that and then i all it was kind of all at the same time though um i i, I still don't think i would have identified as an atheist at that point i think i still would have identified as a Christian when I was going through these things. Um, but everything, it kind of felt like my world was open to look at everything. If I'm questioning, I might as well look at it all. And there's just a few ideas that really grabbed, grabbed a hold of me for a little bit. Um, but it didn't last very long because obviously when you're starting to look up different counter apologetics and atheism and humanism, Somewhere in there, they, they do start to kind of teach you also that it's not just atheism, it's also skepticism is how you're going to weed out the uh, falsehoods. And so it really was kind of getting used to that kind of thought process. And then it, and then it was pretty easy for me to say, like, you know, well, these things have just as much proof as um, religions. So they might be true, but there's no good reason to believe them either. So... And then I was free. <laughs> I was free from all that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of things actually thrown up there. Um, first of all, I'm not absolutely sure. I'm not absolutely sure what astral projection is. What, okay, what is so I, I okay, astral projection and lucid dreaming were two things that I got into big when I was in the law of attraction or law of attraction. So um, lucid dreaming is something that I actually can do, and I've always been able to do it somewhat um it's basically when you're um conscious sleeping so it's like there's this in-between state when you're falling asleep you can kind of um some people can get control of it i've sort of done it a few times it's basically when you're aware that you're sleeping and it's a really cool kind of experience because you know you're in the dream world but you're aware so you can kind of do stuff that you can't do in real life and so the um 
the <laughs> temptation there is to think that it's real. But it's not. You're still dreaming, but you do have some awareness that you're that you're dreaming. So you can kind of play out this kind of video game kind of reality. Um, and then astral projection is similar. It's 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 more of a, a you're thinking, you focusing when you're meditating, and you're able to kind of almost throw your consciousness outward. And I've had that experience as well. It's really just a certain brain state when you're really in deep into meditation and you can really really picture yourself being somewhere else that's really all i've come to the to believe that it is so and i i still do have those practices i still can meditate like meditation was a great um kind of it was a it was kind of a nice safe place to land when i was coming out of christianity too because it was a nice alternative to prayer <laughs> um but the problem uh, that I needed to overcome was uh, thinking that there was anything real necessarily going on when I was doing those things. I think I was just coming around with different ideas on way to ways to use my imagination. Yeah, I think, yeah, I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I've had that sort of out of body experience before and it's more often happened than not when I've been in the zone playing a sport. Yeah. It's almost like I'm watching myself do it rather than actually you know, in my own body doing it. And of course, it's just a brain state, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that there's, there's so many other things that could explain for it or explain it. Like even, um, you know, I, I've, this is opening up a whole other can of worms, but like, um, different kind of responses to stress. Like I tend to kind of like disassociate, like I kind of zone out is when I'm really stressed out. And I think that that played right into my astral projection idea. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go somewhere else now. <laughs> I mean, I'm not actually leaving the room, but my my mentality, my focus is kind of elsewhere. And I mean, thank goodness for therapists. And I've been doing, I don't do that as much anymore. I think lucid dreaming is mm -hmm. an interesting one. It's something I can, I can do more often than not. So most nights I dream and most nights it's lucid. Yeah. But it's really it, interesting. I have this incredible control over the dreams where I can actually rewind and and play it forward slightly differently. And I, I sometimes wish I could do real life like that. And it's but like, really cool, right? Like it is so fun. Yeah. I've I, I've experienced it. It's 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 awesome. I have no. I, it makes sense why people think it's something this special that you need to you need to do. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah, it is. But I never wake up thinking it's real. I, uh -oh. I always and and normally I can analyze where the elements of the dream came from things mm -hmm. that I've heard in the last few days and or read in the last few days and so on. Mm -hmm. um, oh, atheism e does not equal skepticism. We all have to be constantly aware of this. I can remember a few weeks ago, I was in a conversation with Lilith and it was just after they started the trials of the vaccine in the UK. Mm -hmm. And there was on the news, there was a first woman that was getting the injection and she got the injection. And the next day there were loads of tweets out, obviously from anti-vaxxers. And I didn't realize this at the time saying that she died. Oh, uh, and I was having a conversation just like this with Lilith. And I mentioned this and Lilith said, don't be stupid. And she just <laughs> quickly Googled it and said, but yeah, and there was the, you know, woman had actually written an article saying, despite reports of my death, I'm actually fine. <laughs> Aw. Yeah. So, I, I, I still, I, I, I see it a lot still, even in my, uh, my close family and friends, like, um, there's not a, you have to be taught how to not na be naturally skeptic in some cases. I think some people are already. Um, but if you're, I don't know, I, I, I just see a lot of the, it's, often the same people who have some sort of superstitious belief or a religious belief of some sort they are often to be the same people who fall for different conspiracy theories um, without fact checking or knowing how to uh, find the source of you know where it came from um, and I've, I've noticed that it's a very touchy spot when I when I do ask people in my life <laughs> um, well, what, what was your source for that um, that's such a simple question that really throws a wrench into the whole thing <laughs> okay let's let's move to the next one now uh you've got this condescending we call it condescending oh, yeah. tweet <laughs> so 
Marv Thielman. Mm. I stood here last night. He's got a picture of his garden or whatever, or a forest and some plants. This is, it's got a nice house if that's his house. Mm -hmm. I stood here last night praying for you, prayed the mysteries of your life and purpose for you. Take away, you are understood and nothing is wasted. You are not called to the life which has hurt you. You are invited to intimacy and true power with the Father. And you just said, this is obnoxious and condescending. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to well, expand on that at all? There's so many things about that. I, and I, I left it just obnoxious and condescending, but um, tons of things. Like, first of all, like, um, it's obnoxious, I think, to repost that um, and put it out to the world that you, you that he has decided that my my story and my narrative is not valid because I don't fit into his narrative. Um, I don't fit into like his idea of it all. So therefore, I, I am deemed helpless and I need some sort of assistance from him in a very public way that also is a huge virtue signal to the rest of his community. Um, the assumption that my deconversion is a result of my past hurt, um, there's that, and which is also just very invalidating to, or not, um, yeah, invalidating, but it's also just super presumptuous that like everyone who leaves has had some sort of hurt in the church and that we're just it feeds into that whole idea that like you're just angry at god and that you're just you're mad at christians you're not necessarily you know you, maybe you still believe deep down inside there's so many things in that in that wrap up into one tweet um that irritated me um and I think he needed to get called out for it. So I, I posted that and he got called out for it. Yeah, it's this thing about them presupposing that everybody actually believes. And I, I've mentioned a few times that I want to formulate a presuppositional atheism position yeah. where, you know, we, we all know that nobody actually believes in God, but some people are just so frightened of dying, they have to make stuff up. Um, have, have you ever you watched Pine Creek? No. He should. <laughs> he has a he has a presuppositional argument that he has that, um, and he's he's mostly just like he's shooting the shit. He like just has fun on his channel, and I love watching it. So he he runs up against these presuppositionalists with the presupposition that the universe exists, and so um, and he works at it from that. And and it's 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 great. It's a great counter argument towards the presuppositions presupps presuppositional apologetics but i have also noticed that like i i get into a lot of um conversations on twitter and you know it, it goes it only goes so far until they back off into the or they fall back onto rather presupposition um apologetics because uh, that's they're just digging their digging their heels in <laughs> yeah the position i i take on a lot of this is the position that uh, tom jump often puts forward mm. in debates in that the only thing that any of us actually know is that we're experiencing something mm -hmm. we can't be sure about what we're experiencing and i can't be sure that you're experiencing something the only thing that i know for sure is that i am mm -hmm. so anything that you add on to that immediately becomes you know questionable doesn't it mm -hmm. And so if you go to the most fundamental level, there is no God there involved. There's just the fact that you're experiencing something. Yeah. Which, which is interesting. But I often find when they do these philosophical games where they're trying to invalidate, you know, everything, the way that we think about the universe and what we experience, well, it validates their position as well because, you know, if everything's – not right and everything's made up then your bible is not right <laughs> nothing in there actually it's very it's a it is very flawed yeah <sighs> yeah I, I, I oh go ahead i've got i've got this one from uh that you responded to as well from somebody called david taylor not not a common name at all <laughs> he says i truly respect your journey you might just haven't traveled far enough to doubt that you doubt interesting <laughs> does it mean anything to you that you're not respecting others journeys and that you are causing others to fall away too 
Are you willing to take on that kind of responsibility? What if all atheists and agnostics are wrong? I, I don't see how we can be. We just don't think there's enough evidence for God out there. And that actually is pretty true. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's not the assertion that there is no God. Yeah, of course, we could be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Will you be okay with spending eternity in hell, whatever that means? <laughs> he said, when I read comments like this, all I see is fear. I hear if other people can lose their faith, that means I could too. That's a great tweet. <laughs> yeah. what, what do you think about what he said there? Um, I, I, I don't worry about it. I, <laughs> I don't worry about them leading people astray because I, I've always believed even – during the peak of my deconstruction is that if it's true, it can be scrutinized and it will still be true. So I don't, I think that any amount of questions that you bring up are, you should look into them. Um, and obviously I, I, I do, I have come to the, I have come to the point where I'm convinced that it's not true. So I, I do have a bit of a uh, purpose that I would like to disabuse people of this harmful belief, if you will. <laughs> Um, so I have a bit of a, a mission there as well. Um, and I honestly, when it talks, when it talks about hell, I have got a whole, like, there's a whole bunch of things that I, I feel about that whole idea too. And if it was real, then I will go there knowing that I went there in a place of complete authenticity and honesty that I was just searching for the truth and he didn't provide enough evidence for me. Yeah, there's a, a brilliant quote from Jimmy Snow where he tells people who have deconverted, shut up for three years. So I don't know if you've heard yeah, that. Yeah, that's actually been, a, that's been an interesting one for me. Um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you my response. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I mean, he has a response to it himself. Yeah. But uh, you don't strike me as a sort of person who's who should shut up for three years because you don't, come across as, as angry and feeling that you've been lied to and all this sort of stuff. Everything that you tweet out there uh, that I see seems to be well-reasoned, well-thought-out and not expressed from a position of anger. Mm. And, and Jimmy himself says, I don't mean that everybody should fall into that category, but I would say that you definitely don't fit into that category. Well, I, I really do appreciate you saying that. I I... I've actually had that used against me already once, um, Jimmy's expression of um, shut the fuck up for four years. <laughs> um, I will just say I have one person in my life who is a, a an agnostic and and he basically used that as some sort of creed that like I, what I'm doing is wrong, that I shouldn't, that, you know, even Jimmy Snow, the... <laughs> said that <laughs> you shut the fuck up for four years. And I said, and I, I just, I just thought, um, well, first of all, I needed a place to spew my frustrations. And, and when I think when I first started, I still did have a bit of, I still have a little bit of that anger in me. Um, second of all, I didn't really start off trying to get a following. I was just, I, I, I started off anonymous. I didn't have my face on. Um, and I was just posting some thoughts because I needed somewhere to post it. And I was, I was not, I was on Twitter and I was also on Reddit and I was posting thoughts. Um, but then, you know, it gained some traction and then, and then I kind of had the courage to come out and put my, my identity as long with my words. And, um, so I definitely am grateful that I had that. I'm glad that I didn't shut up for four years because I, I need, I think part of my getting to the place where I feel quite grounded and, I'm okay with it was the opportunity that I had to not be quiet. Um, I definitely understand where he's coming from, where there's a, there are people who come on, um, come out of their, their, their religious belief and they, they just, they're, they're you know, they're just flying off. They, they, they don't have a purpose in what they're doing. And, and, um, so I, I, I think there should be maybe a few more qualifiers on there that if you're an angry, if you're still angry, be quiet, <laughs> maybe or something to do with that. And I also can also uh, credit the fact that like I was actively seeking out counseling during this time too, before even that I was online. So I, I was very active about 
seeking help to resolve my anger and to come around to these things. Um, and I also, I also just use, you know, the common sense that like, I don't want to post anything that my kids are going to read someday and, and, um, be embarrassed about. So I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Not everybody has that kind of a, I mean, hopefully my kids aren't on my Twitter for a long time, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, when I say people, when like Seth had asked me too, like, what, well, what if everybody, your family discovers you? I hope that when people discover, you know, in my extended family and stuff that they find it, that, that I still stand strong by everything that I've put on the internet. So it's kind Good. of my step on it. Excellent answer. So my final thing was, uh, your friend of mine, Frank Turek. <laughs> it's, it's, inter it's interesting. Yeah, uh, uh, Robert Reed, who, who's been on a few times. I must get Robert in again soon. It's uh, with the COVID and the Black Lives Matter thing. It's been very, very difficult. And yeah, I, I must have, must approach him again because Robert's been a, a recurrent guest, and it's always an interesting conversation. But he often says that he would quite happily push Frank Turek into moving traffic. <laughs> Which I, I don't, I don't think, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't actually do because Robert's a, I, a gentle I giant. I don't think that um, anyone frustrates me more in the apologetic empire than Frank Turek. And I, you know, uh, Apologia uh, always says like Ken Ham, Ken Ham made him an atheist. And I, I, the, the closest thing I could say to that is that Frank Turek may be an atheist because <laughs> when I was looking for answers, and I looked at his video and I was repulsed by him. I was repulsed by his, the way he treated people, like treated the people who were doubting. I, I was completely turned off to um his answers his attitude and he it, i i just i don't know why he has a job he's a ter <laughs> either than pumping like you know pumping up the um the self-esteem of people who would need to kind of be in that almost bully territory of, of apologetics i think he's i think he's awful <laughs> and i'm happy to like you know tell him that on twitter <laughs> yeah i and my first introduction to Frank, my, my first introduction to him was when he had the debate with Christopher Hitchens. And in that, he didn't come off as quite such a, a complete asshole. He, mm. And so I, I had this view that he was maybe of the more thinking sort of end of stuff. But the more I see of him, I just think, oh, my God, you, mm. you're just talking absolute crap. And talking yep. of talking absolute crap, there's, here's his tweet that you responded to. You're raising all of these objections because you're sleeping with your girlfriend. Am I right? All the blood drained from the young man's face. He was caught. He was rejecting God because he didn't like God's morality. Mm -hmm. And you said, I became an atheist as a happily married woman, nine years, a stay-at-home mum who clothed, <laughs> diapered my babies, and occasionally makes my own bone broth. Your stereotype doesn't <laughs> hold at Frank to uh, Dr. Frank Turek, would he? <laughs> do, do you want to expand on that a bit? I just I, I, he he's obsessed with uh, with making everybody who you know becomes an atheist is looking like a like something that Christians need to fear, like um, so painting them with a with a brush of everything that Christians are trying to avoid and what they. Th think that might happen if kids lose lose their faith right so i it's just it's just simple to come up against him with that kind of stuff and be like not everybody is even doing the things that christians would think are bad like for all intents and purposes my life is exactly the same i'm i still do the same daily errands with and like the same things with my kids <laughs> like not everybody who loses their faith uh loses it because they really really want to sleep with their girlfriend and you know not that that's even a valid point because obviously but um it's just there needs to be people speaking up because like i feel like there's so many people who would watch that video and be like oh yeah like like the so-and-so who's asking me questions i'm going to look at their life now and think about the different ways that i can judge them and then discredit um their questions it's so it's so easy if anybody who doubts me as long as i can point to anything going on in their life that doesn't fall within my God morality, then boom, the, the doubts, it's, it's over. But then 
people like me and hopefully others that come, you know, stand up to it and be like, if you saw my life right now, there, I don't think there's anything that you could point to that would say, well, that's why you don't believe anymore. Cause you just really wanted to, um, you know, do this one thing, this, this, this lifestyle thing that Christians don't agree with. So he's wrong. He's just wrong. Yeah. He's doing something that's known as poisoning the well there. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think, you know, most people who uh, have listened to any of my interviews know pretty much that I'm the poster boy for the sinner. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, the thing is, is like the, the whole conversation about why, like what we view as, or what they view as sin, like that, that's a whole conversation that needs to come way later. But he's, you know, at that point, you're still talking with Christians and you're still talking with them where they believe that there's a lifestyle that goes along with their beliefs. So it doesn't take much to get them on that fence, like on the off, on the defensiveness of like, oh, well, actually, I shouldn't listen to this person because they're doing something. It doesn't even like, yeah, poisoning the well is exactly what it is. Yeah. Okay, well, we've come to the the end of my talking point. So we, we have actually been going for quite a while. Yeah. So um, I am going to thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having and, me. On. And I do still feel that there is more that we could discuss. So would you be happy to come back a second time at some stage? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I can talk. I can talk nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think you had some really good points today, and where can people get hold of you? I know that you're on Twitter. You said you're on Reddit as well. Um. I wouldn't say Reddit's a good place to come find me. I'm totally incognito yeah. there. Um, right now, Twitter is my main my main source for this kind of content. Um, I will be doing a couple more things on on YouTube, and I'm going to be on Truth Wanted in a couple of weeks here, which is kind of exciting. Okay. Um, but Truth, pretty much, Truth Wanted is that is that with um, Dan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. right now, it's just basically on Twitter. Yeah. Maybe in the future, maybe if you know, COVID settles and my kids actually go back to school, maybe I'll start a channel of my own, <laughs> but not right now. <laughs> well, you've got you've got a quite a good following on Twitter as we as we mentioned, and I think that's because of the quality of, of what you tweet out. Thank you. And, I appreciate that. And not just the quality of what you tweet tweet out, but the percentage of it that's quality, as I say, quite a lot of what <laughs> I tweet out is junk. <laughs> I just fire it off. A few weeks ago, I had Tim Sledge on. I don't know if you follow Tim at all. Oh, I totally do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And he, he's the most he, magnificent tweeter, isn't he? And, and he actually oh, told me that so he, sits, he sits and plans them out before he tweets them. He sits with a pen and paper and tries to make mm -hmm. sure that his tweets read exactly as he wants them and I, he uses yeah. characters. I, I'm, I do something very similar. I often will, I, ha I have in my phone, like the notes. Um, I usually have a couple of tweets that I'm kind of working on. A lot of the times, the ones that go really big are the ones where I got a little emotion behind it and it comes to me kind of suddenly. But I, I do really try to spell check and, and you know, when I when there is one that has a has a, a typo, like it bothers me. I think I'm a bit of, a bit of a perfectionist. Um, but I try to put a lot of thought, uh, thought into them, and I try to be very clear about what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. As Somebody else, less... I think, who, who does really good tweets is uh, Red Evelation. I don't know if you follow him. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, he, was, he was on the other day because he and Lilith do Veritas Voices, and I had them both on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, love his, I love his tweets, and he's not even tweeting in his first language, which is incredible. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Follow, I follow him as well. But everybody should follow you on Twitter. Everybody who's interested in, the, in you know, the religious argument or the, the anti-religious argument, if you like, should follow you. And hopefully, uh, I'll certainly put your Twitter handle in the description box of this interview. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to keep going because I feel like there's still lots more to say about this. And then there's um, more people who are feeling quite trapped, I think, right now. And they they just need a few people to stand up and give a little um, a little identity behind the, athe the scary atheist uh, label to give them a little confidence as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's be honest. What's happening in the U.S. might be quite different if they'd had 
a government of well not let's not say atheists but a government of humanists yeah yeah i totally yeah. agree well yeah. thank you so much for having me no it's been my absolutely my pleasure I, i've enjoyed this and without you know wanted to disrespect any of my other guests i, I particularly enjoyed this one oh, I, I enjoyed them all but i particularly <laughs> enjoyed this chat it's been great oh that, i appreciate that thank you I've enjoyed it too. I felt like it was e a free flowing, easy conversation. Yeah. And I wanted it to be different to some of your other ones, you know, just doing your story every single time is, um, you know, it gets a bit old, I think. Yeah. I think, I think my, the bare bones of my story, like are, are kind of out there now. So, but there's so much more, there's so, so much more to the whole big picture of it all. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I'll leave it with that word.